ministry mp kv rauri please come on the dais and have a seat please डॉक्टर टकाशी डॉक्टर मिलने मैम एंड डॉक्टर फरांडे सर प्लीज कम ऑन द डाइस एंड हैव अ सीट प्लीज द रेपोचियर्स फॉर द सेशन आर मिसेस ज्योति खराडे एंड बीजी मारी प्लीज कम ऑन द डाइस Now I introduce the chairman of the session, Dr. A. S. Dhawan sir. Dr. A. S. Dhawan sir is an agriculture gradu graduate and PhD from Indian Agriculture Research Institute, New Delhi. He started his career as an assistant professor in 1985 and worked in different cadres like associate professor, professor. head of the department associate dean director of extension and education like basant rao naik marathwada which is professor unique for more than 30 years kishan singh who worked as a veterinary fellow at ormond hill university kodaveli usa and university of california davis during 1995 to 1996 Within the span of 33 years of his agriculture education, research, and extension, his major scientific contributions are scientific evaluation of NADEC method of compost making, strengthening of soil water plant testing laboratory as a central facility, generation of technology for nutrient management through INM in combination with in situ rainwater conservation. and uh, he has more than 200 refer journal papers review articles book and book chapters he has guided more than 20 students for post graduate and doctoral researches dr dhawan has extensively traveled in india and few countries abroad in connection with his profession he has organized many national and international conferences he has received many awards in the field of agriculture sciences He is currently working as a vice chancellor of Basant Rao Naik Marathwada Krishi Vidya Pit Parbhani since 2018. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our co-chairman Dr. B D Bhakre sir. Dr. B D Bhakre is an agriculture graduate and PhD from M P K V Rauri. He started his career as a senior research assistant in 1984 and worked in different cadres like assistant professor, associate professor. professor at mpkv nauri for more than 34 years he has been carrying out basic and applied research in terms of soil fertility water technology and management of problematic soil within the span of 34 years of his agricultural education research and extension his major scientific contributions are development of package of systematic application of organic manure then inorganic fertilizer and bio fertilizers He has published more than 200 refer journal papers, review articles, book and book chapters. He has guided more than 40 students for postgraduate and doctoral researches. He has organized many national and international conferences and workshops. He is currently working as a head department of soil science, M P K V Rauri since 2000 now. Uh, now I request uh, Mrs. Gurke, ma'am. She is there. Now I request to Chairman Sir to take the dais for further proceeding. Hello, uh, good morning, everybody. At the outset, uh, I express my deep sense of gratitude and indebtedness to our organizer. 
for giving me an opportunity to chair this uh, very important function which is centered around the soil resilience and sustainability. Friends, uh, today, <coughs> apart from my co-chair, Dr. Bhakre, we have three distinguished speakers uh, representing different parts of the globe. Uh, one is Dr. Takasi, uh, he's from Japan and will be talking about the site-specific fertilizer management for enhancing sustainability and productivity of soil resources. We have Madam Eleanor Milne from United Kingdom who will be talking on the estimating the impacts of agricultural practices on soil organic carbon in tropical agriculture. And we have a distinguished speaker from India, Dr. Ashok Farande. He is also again a very distinguished soil scientist known throughout the country and will be talking about the integrated reclamation technology for Springswell soils. Of course, we will be missing Dr. Ashok Patra, who is the director of Indian Institute of Soil Science. <coughs> Otherwise, it would have been another distinction of sharing three Ashoks the same dais in the morning. We all, Ashok Dhawan, Ashok Patra and Ashok Parande. Anyway, will be missing certainly, but uh, friends, let me tell you that this is a very important session because the sustainability of sugar can yield is a big challenge for all of us. And the basic handicap is how to maintain the organic carbon levels, particularly in a country like uh, India, which is a tropical climate. And maintaining the organic carbon level in the tropical climate is a big task. But certainly we have a colleague, although she is from temperate climate, but talking will be a tropical climate, isn't it? So that's an opportunity for us to listen her. Of course, we have uh, 30 minutes for each speaker. Since Dr. Patra is not here, I can take a liberty of allotting five extra minutes to each speaker and another, another 10 minutes for the discussions. With this note, uh, now I request the first speaker, Dr. Takasi, to start his presentation. Dr. Takasi, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished guests, and prof. Excuse me, oh. just a fall. I mean, uh, let her introduce yourself. I mean, this. Oh, this. okay. She will introduce herself, oh, and then you okay. can. Let's take a little stage. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Please. Uh, so by mistake, I could not. Uh... Uh, now I will introduce uh, Dr. Takashi, sir. Dr. Takashi has completed his PhD from Kyoto University, Japan. He is a professor in Department of Global Liberal Arts, Faculty of International Communication, H University, Naogya, Japan. He is also a president of International Union of Soil Science. He had been carrying out basic and fundamental research and its application in terms of soil genesis and classification soil information system, soil fertility and land capability, land and soil degradation, remediation and reclamation, and soil and environmental education. He dedicated 39-year long career in research and education. He has started his career as an assistant professor during 1981 to 1994. And from 2017, he is working as a professor in Department of Global Liberal Arts H University, Japan. His uh, major achievements is he developed of the methodology for internet-based soil resources information management. He was president of the Japanese Society of Pedology, president of uh, International Union of Soil Science. He was editor-in-chief of Soil Science and Plant Nutrition and Japanese Journal of Soil Science and Plant Nutrition and Pedologist Journal. He has received many awards like Leading Professor in Research Award, Award of Excellence, and Presidential Award. 
he was he has published more than 230 research papers in national and international journals and now he is delivering a lecture on site specific fertilizer management for enhancing sustainability and productivity of soil resources now i request sir So, uh, thank you very much again uh, for your introduction, Chairman. Uh, distinguished guests and the professors, scientists, practitioners, and the ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, since I am now serving as the president of the International Union of Soil Sciences, on behalf of our organizations, Um, I would like to express my sincere congratulations for the second international conference and to thank VSI for inviting us to this very important uh, conference and to thank uh, VSI for uh, your support. I'm very honored and uh, privileged to be given a chance uh, to talk about a part of our activities. Additionally, I personally am very happy that uh, you people recognize the importance of soil and the soil science, as well as the soil scientists, for enhancing the sugar industries. But frankly speaking, I'm not a sugar scientist, just a sugar eater. I love sweets very much. Um, just like uh, I, I like dirt and uh, soil. So uh, this morning, I would like to talk about one of the, our innovative technologies, which is still on the way, though, under the title of the site-specific fertilizer management for enhancing sustainability and productivity of soil resources. Okay. Before going into the detail, I suppose I'd better mention a little bit about our organizations. International Unions of Soil Sciences. Our union is the Global uh, Union of Soil Scientists. And the objectives of the IUSS are to promote all branches of soil science and to support all soil scientists across the world in the pursuit of their activities. Uh, National societies of soil sciences are the members of our union, and now we can count like 80 plus uh, national societies other mem has a membership in our union. And if you are the members of the uh, national societies, you are automatically the members of the international unions of soil sciences. Um, we uh, we have. Uh, presidential committee uh, consisting of three uh, presidents. Uh, one is the uh, uh, former president, uh, Professor Ratan Lal. Ratan Lal, the left hand side. And uh, uh, incoming president, the right hand side. Uh, Professor uh, Laura Sanchez from Mexico, and myself, the three other members of the presidential committee. So uh, we are uh, steering the union together with the uh, uh, 10 to 15 
executive members in our unions. The biggest thing that we have to take care of is the World Congress of Soil Science. Uh, it will be uh, organized every four years. So the next will be uh, 2022 in Glasgow in UK. So if you have a chance, well, please join us at the World Congress of Soil Science in 2022. Well, I would like to talk about uh, okay, the uh, problems that we are facing uh, nowadays. The human security, maybe many of you have heard about uh, this term. This is the uh, proposed or the mentioned by the Kofi Annan, the past uh, uh, United Nations uh, uh, Secretary in 2000. He mentioned uh, the human security has uh, two aspects. They are the freedom from fear and the freedom of want. And oops. if you are looking at the soil resources, what well, you can see a lot of environmental destructions. This is a kind of you know the freedom from uh, fear that we have to uh, work for. And of course, uh, a shortage of food is another big problem related to soil resources. But this is one aspect of the uh, want. So uh, we have to get rid of such two fears, see, the freedom of fears and the freedom of wants. So that's the point uh, we have to work for uh, to uh, the human security. But uh, soil degradation is really a big problem because it is a threat to the human securities in terms of two aspects mentioned here. Well, you may know that 52% uh, of the land used for agriculture is moderately to or severely affected by soil degradation. And uh, land degradation affected 1.5 billion people globally. And due to drought and desertification, this is a kind of land degradation, but 12 million hectares per year, it is equivalent to 23 hectares per minute are getting lost. And 74% uh, of the poor people are directly affected by land degradation. That's why you know, our union uh, worked very much about against to, uh, to protect the soil resources. And uh, uh, FAO and the United Nations, they also uh, paid a big attention. And they uh, declared the 2015 as the International Year of Soils, that is five years ago. And at the end of uh, 2015, uh, this is the International Year of Soils, uh, we, the IESS, declared the Vienna Soil Declaration uh, in addressing uh, the major resources, environmental, health, and social problems which humanity is currently facing. To solve such problems, we have to work for uh, a very much uh, in terms of the key roles uh, played by the soils. So we started at the end of the uh, International Year of Soils, another project named our uh, International Decade of Soil till the 2024. So we believe that uh, International Year of Soil uh, is not only the chance, so we have to continue. So it is incumbent on IUSS members to not only to maintain the levels of activities generated in International Year of Soils, but to increase the momentum and the extent of our contributions on the soils issues as we move towards 
our centenary of the IUSS formation in 2024. We are doing some activities, for instance, uh, publication, uh, public outreach, or education, or the dissemination of the, uh, the information, and the uh, publication of book series. There are, we have such uh, what, tools uh, to, to activate our activities, but in varieties of topics. But one of the, the most important you know, topics is, I should say, the soil fertility management. As you know, the sustainable development goals were born at the uh, United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development in Rio de Janeiro in 2012 to produce a set of universal goals that meet the urgent environmental, political, and economical challenges facing our world. As you know, they established the three, uh, 17 goals, starting from no poverty, zero hunger, and the good health and the well-being, such and such. But if you look at the 15th the goals, that's the life on land, which is uh, the closest uh, the topic that we are handling. But the soil is very much related to, I should say, most of the such, uh, such goals listed uh, here in the 17 goals. The goal 15, what is this? The life on land aims to conserve and restore the use of terrestrial ecosystems such as forest, wetland, dryland, and mountains by 2020. It's almost time. Okay. They set up the uh, more concrete targets, like uh, by 2020, ensure the conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of terrestrial and inland freshwater ecosystems and their services in, partic in particular forests, wetlands, mountains, and dryland in line with obligations under the international agreement. And uh, by 2030, the combat desertification restore degraded land and soil, including land affected by desertification, drought, and floods, and strive to achieve a land degradation neutral world. That is the, uh, the goal, this named as the life on land. But how we can make it? That's a problem. So today, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, site-specific fertilizer management. You may say as the uh, precision agriculture. Well, that is quite common to hear, but uh, we don't know yet. Is it useful or the beneficial? How that uh, topic is coming up, if we look, ba uh, look, look back, well, there is a demand for high yield, high quality of crop, and there's a, again the demand for sustainability. We have to uh, make sure the efficient soil management or fertilizer management. So, this site specific management in, or the precision agriculture become an alternative uh, and can be replaced or via a conventional management. But we need for a quantitative evaluation of spatial and temporal variability of soil properties. Otherwise, we can't make uh, precision agriculture, site-specific management. So uh, we, we have done, we, uh, I'd like to introduce you uh, some of our you know, research work that we have done in previous years. Uh, we did have a experiment or sampling from one field, like uh, 0.5 hectares, not big. But we cut into uh, small pieces of land, 100 plots, 
5 meter times 10 meters small plots, and we collected the data from there, the soil's data, as well as the crop performance from those data, and find out what is the uh, variability and how we can control the variability in accordance with the uh, conservation of the natural resources. The one, I would like to talk about the uh, spatial variability of soil properties and yield and their relationships. If you look at this uh, uh, tables, you can find uh, the CV, or the coefficient of variance, for all uh, soil properties. If you look at the uh, okay, inorganic Uh, inorganic nitrogen, the right uppermost uh, property, has a very high uh, coefficient of variance, 34%. But if you look at uh, okay, the pH, the left, the top you know, the property, has only 1.6%. And uh, the, the, the other properties like tot EC, total nitrogen, total carbon, or exchangeable uh, uh, nutrients, they are the between uh, pH and uh, uh, okay, inorganic nitrogen. So it depends on the, you know, the properties, how big or small the you know, variations. Um, we analyzed, we, we used uh, a, this technique called uh, a geostatistics. We used um, semi variograms and uh, uh, we, we made up uh, uh, models to predict what is going on in the field and to prepare the map of each uh, properties. If you look at the total nitrogen, and uh, okay, the next one is available nitrogen, any inorganic nitrogen, and the right hand side is available phosphorus and exchange of potassium. Each property has its own you know, distributions or the uh, patterns in the, uh, the field. Those are all affected by our management. I'm sorry, right? it's uh, not very much clear. But uh, it affects some of the natural conditions. Uh, if you look at the uh, left, uh, the bottom, there's the uh, gradient of the, you know, the topography. And uh, uh, right and left uh, up, up side is the highest areas, and uh, right bottom is the lowest. So the, this is the, uh, the paddy field. Not, I'm sorry, this is not the uh, uh, sugar cane, but uh, this is the paddy field. So the irrigation water coming from the uh, top left end flows down to the uh, right bottom. You know, such a, a the movement of the water is taking place. So such, you know, the characteristics affect uh, each of the patterns of the uh, soil properties that we, we studied, we learned from this, you know, these studies. We also collected the, uh, you know, the field variation in terms of uh, crop performance. Well, this is the map of the yield of rice in one field. It's not you know, uniform. It has some uh, patterns. For instance, okay, the bottom is a bit higher, uh, you know, the yield, and the left uh, top part is the, uh, the low yield. You know. uh, so uh, it has the special patterns individ for, for individual you know, uh, farm. That's what we have to know. So uh, we collected the soils data and uh, uh, analyzed, and we find out, uh, after the application of the uh, statistical analysis, we find out the soils can be determined by three factors, like uh, organic matter factors, or exchangeable basis factors, and uh, uh, soluble salt factors. So we established the model to predict the yield using the three 
factors like organic matter factor scores and exchangeable bases factor scores and uh, uh, soluble salt factor scores. So we made this, you know, the model equations and we checked the estimated, you know, the yield, how close to the, the actual measured field. Well, I should say it, it is quite okay, but uh, <laughs> well, somebody says, well, not yet. Maybe we, we have to improve more, but of course, this is still on the way. Anyhow, so uh, if, we, if we use uh, such, you know, the, the models, we can predict, you know, the, the crop performance as well. Right. So the equation explains the 6% of the non-random variation and uh, site-specific management a uh, precision agriculture is thus worth practicing. That's what we, 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 we got from this uh, you know, the, the research. If the uh, random variation is controlled everywhere, it's no chance to use the precision agriculture. But in this case, we found you know, the non-random variation can explain 6% of the total variation. It means that if we can control the non-random variation, it means uh, the variation which has some meaning. Okay. So we can hit uh, the core, the meaning, or hit, hit the point which produces low yield. That's what we can get it. The such information we can collect it from this uh, experiment. Then I'll talk about the effect of site-specific management with reduced fertilizer usage. We tried the actual, you know, the uh, management. One is a uniform application of the uh, fertilizers, and the another one is a site-specific fertilizer management. Okay, there are two, uh, yeah, two, two, two patterns. And we reduced the amount of you know, nitrogen fertilizers on the site-specific you know, management. And we found the yield gives us the same, like uh, 7.293 for the uniform you know, uh, applications and uh, 7.290 from site-specific management. But uh, we, can, we can save the 10% of the uh, nitrogen fertilizer from 100 to 87%. Well, uh, percent. Okay. And uh, well, the, if you look at the uh, bottom CV, CV reduced from 8.0 to 4.2. So the variation you know, uh, reduced to half of the uniform application. So site-specific management can uh, gives you a more uniform uh, quality or more uniform uh, the, the yield of the crop performance. That we can get it. As well as we can uh, save the amount of the nitrogen fertilizer. So site-specific management could reduce the environmental impact of farming without any negative effect on soil production. That's what we found. So what is then, how is the, uh, you know, the stability of the such patterns? So we, we studied here. So this is the, uh, uh, the patterns of each uh, soil properties, like uh, total nitrogen and the inorganic nitrogen, TN and IN, like this, for four different years. If you look at the TN, the upper series, this is quite uniform. But if you look at the lower series, inorganic nitrogen, wow, that's quite very random, all right? So uh, it all depends on the you know, soil properties. So the temporal stability of spatial patterns depends on the soil property. And uh, for instance, okay, total nitrogen shows a very high stability, but uh, inorganic nitrogen 
shows very low stability. So that's what we have to know that. And then the next, we are talking about uh, okay, the temporal you know, the stabilities. So if you look at the uh, old uh, solid characteristics from available phosphorus to uh, mineralizable nitrogen, and three different colors means, uh, okay, the first year and second year, third year, how the value or the amount is changing. That's what, you know, is shown. Here, we can say that uh, stability depends on the soil property examined, and uh, for instance, available phosphorus, AP, and the total nitrogen, TN, and the total uh, carbon, those have a very high stability. So it does not change very much you know, year by year. But if you look at the IN, international nit uh, inorganic nitrogen, or mineralizable nitrogen, that you know, stability is very low. It means uh, changing every year and every year like this. So uh, stability, of course, it decreases as time lag increases, but you should look at the, uh, the characteristics which should be stable. Then you can save money and time for uh, analyzing the uh, uh, soil characteristics. Okay. And then the next, uh, finally, I would like to talk about the uh, relationships between temporal variability and the spatial variability of soil properties. Well, this uh, picture shows the, uh, the relationships. Well, you may find that the uh, high temporal variation well, the uh, vertical axis, high temporal variation are associated with high spatial variation. That's the uh, horizontal axis. But uh, if you look at uh, uh, no, <laughs> if you look at the uh, okay, total nitrogen (TN) or the total carbon or av available phosphorus or uh, potassium, well, those are, those, those are a bit below the lines, you know, one to one line, just a bit below. It means uh, spatial variation is more than temporal variation. So in such, you know, the characteristics, you can use for the specific, you know, the fertilizer management. But uh, if you find, uh, okay, the temporal variation is bigger than the spatial variation, that's very difficult to use as for uh, site-specific management. Such information also uh, we, can, we could collect from this uh, you know, the experiment. And uh, uh, that's why we have to use such a long reliability a, a data uh, shown as uh, pH or the CN ratio or the total nitrogen or total carbon or available phosphorus or potassium, they are quite stable. So uh, we should use uh, more and more those data. Okay. So the, I would like to summarize my presentation like uh, Number one, the soil properties and the grain yield show the considerable spatial variation. And the soil organic matter was the main determining factors for yield and soil chemical properties explain 65% of non-random variation of the yield, suggesting the potential of the precision agriculture. Number two, the temporal stability of the soil properties varied reflecting the intrinsic characteristics of the property. And number three, the spatial vari variations were generally higher than the temporal uh, variation, which suggesting the importance of the management of the spatial variation. Yes. Okay. So the uh, site-specific fertilizer management, uh, precision agriculture, is useful and beneficial. That is our you know, conclusion. So the maintenance 
and the improvement of soil fertility is providing food, fiber, fuel, etc. It's a global issue, but the solution is quite site and area specific. So we need a collaboration with business firms as well as academic bodies in collecting, sharing, analyzing, and utilizing uh, data each other. And thus, IUSS, we provide the forum to support such tasks. So I hope uh, everybody can join us and uh, to exchange ideas and find out the right way uh, to uh, apply the uh, site-specific fertilizer management for the conservation of the natural resources, particularly the soil resources. This is one of the target of the international thank decade of soil. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Dr. Kasi, for being very specific to the time frame given for this topic, as the name of the topic goes. But uh, I can still uh, have a five minutes for some pinpointed questions pertaining to this presentation, if any. Please, please come forward. Please, please have a mic. Maybe you can come to the IS in case it's required. <coughs> well. Good morning to all. As, as you presented in your presentation, ki there is no difference in yield by adopting the site-specific fertilizer management. But I wanted to know ki what is the impact of site-specific fertilizer management on nutrient use efficiency. Either it is increasing or not. Okay. Uh, one benefit is we can reduce the amount of fertilizers. And if we can reduce the fertilizers, we can reduce the risk of you know, the pollutions to the other you know, the areas. That is the most you know, the, uh, yeah, uh, important, and yes, the benefit. And second question, if suppose we have developed the site-specific fertilizer management for one period, how, how long it will work? Okay. It depends on the uh, fertilizers, but if you use uh, a total nitrogen or total carbon, such data, as we are expecting the, at least five years we can use uh, that strategy to reduce the amount. So maybe after five years or after seven years, you have to recheck the condition of the field and uh, recalculate. Uh, the patterns of the uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Please? Thank you. We can have two more questions. Uh, yeah. Thank you for a good lecture. I wanted to know. I wanted to say that this. World over, entire soils have been completely deep. Hmm. The excessive use of fertilizers and chemical pesticides. Hmm. Despite of whatever you are checking, rechecking, and everything, mm -hmm. it, you cannot mm -hmm. change every farmer to do everything that he wants. Right. Is there is another way of doing things? Is without application of fertilizers, without mm -hmm. taking the soil into consideration. We don't need soil, we don't need fertilizer, we don't need fertilizer. Our yields are much better. Have you ever tested that uh, aeroponics and uh, vertical farming? Mm -hmm. In Japan, I know, 150 um, uh, buildings have come up already with this, okay. and another 150 are right. planned. Um, yes, I know. Uh, there are such fields, you know, that without uh, fertilizer application, you still can get a very good uh, the result. So in, in that case, of course, uh, why? you don't have to worry about the, uh, how much you know, fertilizer is necessary or such. 
or just to, 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 to maintain the soil fertility. So uh, do not uh, well, consume too much you know, the uh, nutrient from the natural resources. That's the point that you have to think. But uh, if the uh, nutrient is not enough, and uh, when you have to apply the fertilizers, how to do it? That is the, you know, the topic that we have done. It. So the natural resources, the fertility is very high. You don't have to worry about very much. But uh, the uh, natural fertility is uh, not very much high. Well, you have to think how to you know, the improve efficiently or uh, you know, the cons as well as conserving the natural resources. So that's the point, that's the, you know, the situation when this technology should be applied. Yeah. Okay, last question, if any. Um, if not, then uh, I request uh, Dr. Takasi to take a seat. I'm very thankful to you yeah. for your nice Thank presentation. You Now I would like to request our chairman sir to present a memento to Dr. Takashi on behalf of VSA. Before I invite the second speaker, I request coordinator to give a brief introduction in note of the speaker. Uh, Dr. Eleanor Milne has 25 years of experience working on various aspects of environmental management in the agriculture and land management sector in developing countries. For the past 17 years, her work has focused on developing tools to estimate the climate change mitigation potential of land management activities in developing countries. She coordinated the Global Environmental Facilities, that is JAP SOC project, which developed a system to estimate changes in soil organic carbon stocks at national and subnational scale. She also coordinated the modeling component of JAP's carbon benefit project, which has developed online tools to estimate the greenhouse gas impacts of land management activities. She has an undergraduate degree in environmental biology from the University of Liverpool, UK, master's degree in crop production and changing environment from Essex University, UK, and PhD which considered soil conservation and maize productivity on subtropical red soils in Yunnan province, China from the University of UK. She has worked as a consultant mainly through Colorado State University on projects for IFAD, USAID, CARE, the World Bank, and UNEP. She is currently an honorary scientist at the Natural Resource Ecology Laboratory, Colorado State University. Now I would like to invite Dr. Milne, ma'am, please deliver a lecture. Okay, so thank you very much. Hello to everybody. Um, I'd like to start by thanking VSI for giving me this fantastic opportunity to come here to this conference, for your uh, amazing generosity, um, and also for your fantastic organization. So my name's Eleanor Milne, and I work for Colorado State University. I'm going to talk about estimating the impact of agricultural practices on soil organic carbon in tropical agriculture. And I also have to say that I am not a sugarcane person, but I'm here to learn about sugarcane. So the outline of my presentation, I'll talk first of all about the demand for land and sustainability, and sustainability is one of the main themes of this conference. I'll talk about soil organic carbon as an indicator of sustainability. 
Then look at agricultural practices which allow us to look after soil organic carbon and give a couple of examples from sugarcane. Then I'll talk about soil organic carbon and climate change mitigation and then estimating soil organic carbon with models. And this is the last thing that I've been working on for the past 18 years. So world population in my lifetime, and I was born in 1970, has actually doubled, which is amazing. We're at about 7.9 billion people now, and it's estimated by the year 2050 we'll actually be at about 9.7 billion people. So the demand for agricultural commodities is predicted to increase by somewhere between 70 and 100% by 2050. This means we're going to need an extra 1 billion tonnes of cereals and 200 million extra tonnes of livestock products every year between now and 2050. And of course already we're seeing a demand for more land and an intensification of agricultural production on existing land. And this is especially true in the tropics where agricultural expansion and intensification are set to continue to increase at a faster pace than anywhere else on the globe. So, sustainability. In order to be able to feed this number of people, this growing population, we're going to need to make better use of our existing lands, better use of lands that are already in agricultural production. And by doing this, we could potentially reduce the need for agricultural expansion into native ecosystems, so we can preserve biodiversity, etc. The key to being able to do this is to manage soils. To manage soils in a sustainable way is key to maximizing long-term productivity on existing land. And I've put long-term in bold here because you can take native ecosystems out of uh, native ecosystems and put them into agricultural production and you'll tend to get increased productivity in the short term, but it won't be long-term sustainable. Okay, so how do we know if soils are being managed sustainably? Well, we can use soil organic carbon, SOC, as a good indicator of soil sustainability. And this is because soil sustainability, soil organic carbon, sorry, is key to so many different functions in the soil. Good soil organic carbon can enhance or maintain nutrient status. We just heard in the previous presentation how soil organic matter was a good indicator of yield. Soil organic carbon can reduce compaction, it can make soil processing easier, it can increase the rooting depth of crops. It can preserve soil biodiversity, so you can reduce the incidence of soil-borne pests. It can improve infiltration and water holding capacity. And this is very important in tropical areas where you have seasonal rainfall and you're relying on the soil holding that water for the rest of the cropping season. Soil organic carbon can reduce the amount of uh, soil that's lost through wind and water erosion, again, very important in tropical areas. And overall, it can increase productivity. So soil organic carbon is key. So in order to look after soil organic carbon, it's all about practices which reduce the amount that is lost and practices which reduce the amount that goes into the system. So activities which deplete soil organic carbon include things like erosion, uh, where you have soil that's left bare, wind erosion, water erosion, intensive tillage practices where the soil is broken down, you enhance decomposition, you lose your aggregates. Changes from native ecosystems tend to always be associated with a loss of soil organic carbon, things like changing from forest to grassland to, to, native, uh, to um, croplands. Land which isn't very productive can also lead to low soil organic carbon. And this is because you don't have returns to the soil through uh, above ground biomass and below ground biomass. So conversely, Activities which rebuild soil organic carbon can include things like including conservation buffers in your croplands. So this is areas where you have native grasses which will build up soil organic carbon and then you can move your cropping areas around. Conservation tillage or no tillage, allowing soil structure to build up. The use of cover crops, 
which again can protect against uh, high intensity rainfall events. Taking some land completely out of production, so set aside, taking an area, letting it um, rewild and go back to native vegetation. And then also improved crop rotations. <laughs> So including um, fallow periods or periods where you have different crops or integrated livestock management systems. All of these can build up your soil organic carbon. So this is a table which is taken from a paper by uh, Professor Paustian who works at Colorado State University and it just summarizes some of the management practices which can lead to increases in carbon inputs. So things like um, Increasing productivity, good management of crop residues, using cover crops, uh, converting from com com to perennial grasses and legumes. And then on the other hand, reducing carbon losses. So things like no tillage, conservation tillage, uh, rewetting of organic soils, etc. So there are lots of management practices which can look after and build up soil organic carbon. So just a couple of examples of how this might relate to sugarcane, and again, I'm not a sugarcane person, but one example could be uh, using green harvesting instead of burned harvesting. And there's actually been a study done in Brazil by Carlos Seri, um, which estimated that through green harvesting rather than burned harvesting, as well as avoiding all of the emissions, greenhouse gas emissions associated with burning the the crop residue, you can also accumulate between 0.7 megagrams of carbon per hectare per year on a sandy soil, up to about 2 megagrams of carbon per hectare on a clay soil. <coughs> and this is in the top 30 centimetres. Excuse me, I've just developed a bit of a cough. <laughs> okay, so as we heard yesterday in some of the presentations, there are disadvantages to green harvesting of sugarcane. We heard from our colleagues when they talked about the situation in Thailand. Um, the availability of labour is an issue, the availability of machinery is an issue. But in the long term, in the, if the investment can be made, it does have advantages in terms of building up soil organic carbon, which in the long term will reduce nutrients through organic matter buildup. It will have higher crop longevity, lower costs for renewing, um, soil protection because of erosion, and also moisture retention, if moisture is an issue in an area where cane is being produced. Of course, burned harvesting has, has some advantages in terms of less labor intensive, <coughs> but in the long run, it will lead to a breakdown of soil organic carbon. Okay, other potential soil organic carbon management options for sugarcane could be the use of cover crops and no-till. Again, this is important in tropical areas because of intent, uh, protection against intense rainfall events. Prevents soil organic matter decomposition, increases soil organic carbon content. If your cover crop is a legume, it will add nitrogen to your system, help to maintain soil structure, improve water use efficiency, <laughs> because you'll be using water from different rooting depths with two different crops. And it's important during the reform of sugarcane fields. Okay, so that's some management practices and the way that they benefit um, soil organic carbon and how this helps crop protection. There's also another vital role for soil organic carbon, and that's in our fight against climate change. So as a means of climate change mitigation. And this is because globally, soils store an estimated 1,500 petagrams of carbon in the top one meter. This is approximately twice the amount that's held in the atmosphere, and it's more than twice the amount that's held in global vegetation. So it's been estimated that on lands which are in permanent agricultural use, carbon sequestration in soils could be between 0.1 and 1 megagram of carbon per hectare per year. So practices which maintain or increase soil organic carbon have a key role to play in climate change mitigation. So how do we know whether the management practices that we implement are actually having an impact on soil organic carbon? Well, you could take measurements across a field, um, but this can be very costly, it can be very time consuming, it involves field work, lab work, 
and it's good for scientific studies, but if you're a producer or a land manager and you want to prove that your change in land management practice is actually going to impact soil organic carbon, you're probably not going to have the time and money to spend doing this. So, there are a number of models which have been developed which can actually estimate the impact of agriculture on soil organic carbon over varying spatial and temporal scales. One of such models is the Century model. This was developed at Colorado State University. And this model simulates <coughs> the movement, it, it simulates plant growth and then the decomposition of plants. <coughs> It has a plant productivity submodel, a water use submodel. It has decomposition pools so that your organic carbon decomposes at different rates in different, uh, different, in different parts of the model. So Century works on a monthly time step and there's also a daily version which works on a daily time step. <coughs> So we worked on a project um, a while back in 2007, which actually linked this dynamic ecosystem model to spatial databases of soils, climate, and land use information. And this allowed us to make large scale estimates of changes in soil organic carbon under different um, circumstances. The century model itself was developed for use in the US. So what we did was we worked with groups in Brazil, India, China, and Kenya to parameterize this model so that it could be used in tropical conditions and could be applicable to tropical conditions. So we produced a number of studies, uh, the Brazilian Amazon, the whole of Kenya, uh, Jordan, and then we worked with Dr. Tapas Bhattacharya, who's from the National Bureau of Soil Survey and Land Use Planning here in India, and he estimated soil organic carbon stock changes under different land management practices for the whole of the Indogangetic Plains. This system has also been used by Galdos et al. to make estimates of different management practices and the impact that they have on soil organic carbon stock changes for the sugarcane producing areas of Brazil. And this is just an example of the type of output that we get from the model. This is the Brazilian Amazon. This area that's highlighted is where there's agricultural expansion, so change from native vegetation into um, cattle production and soybean production. And this gives you an estimate of how soil organic carbon stocks are likely to change over time. Okay, so that model is relatively complicated. It's good to use if you have a team of scientists who have GIS expertise, soil modeling expertise, but if you want something that's easier to use and more aimed at land managers or farmers and producers, we have another system. And this is a user-friendly tool. It's online, so it's available for anyone to use, uh, and it's called the Carbon Benefits Project. Here's the website, and I'll put this up again at the end. So this estimates soil organic carbon and also net greenhouse gas emissions. It's basically a scenario analysis tool. So if you're thinking of making a management change, of implementing a different management practice, you can run the model so that it looks as a business as usual scenario against a project scenario. And it then estimates how this will impact your soil organic carbon, your biomass carbon, but also all of your greenhouse gas emissions associated with that management change. So I've just done a very quick analysis um, taking a hypothetical situation where I had an area in Tamil Nadu, I have a business as usual where I am growing sugar cane, I'm burning, burning it when I harvest it, um, I'm using full tillage. I want to know what would happen if I moved to green harvesting with no till and I used cover crops. I start off with a map, so the first thing the system asks you to do is to designate spatial areas. I've drawn this polygon, Again, this is a hypothetical study. I could draw multiple polygons if I wanted, and I could draw multiple polygons in different countries. I then tell the system how, much, how many hectares are in different land use categories for my starting point, for my business as usual scenario, and for my project scenario. And this is over any given time scale. So I've chosen five years, but I could choose 20 years if I wanted to. 
The rest of the system is then asking you to go through the process of describing how your crop is managed, how much fertiliser is added, how is it tilled, what's happening to the residue. <coughs> and then your analysis produces output which looks something like this. So for my very quick hypothetical analysis where I looked at burned harvesting with full tillage versus no, no burning, um, reduced tillage and also cover crops, this is my results. So anything below the zero line is good because this shows either avoided greenhouse gas emissions or carbon sequestration. So you can see I have avoided a lot of emissions from not burning my crop. I also have a small amount of carbon sequestration in soils. This works out about 5,071 tonnes of CO2 equivalent over 1,000 hectares of over five years, which works out about one tonne of CO2 equivalents per hectare per year. Now, I know this is an underestimation. Um, and what I would like to do is to work with people in the sugarcane producing institutes, etc., to try to better uh, represent sugarcane in the way that it's produced in this model. And I've already met quite a lot of interesting people here who are working on um, carbon sequestration and working on soil carbon models and sugarcane production. So it's been a fantastic opportunity for me. So hopefully if I come back in four years' time and give this talk again, we'll have some more sugarcane-specific results and uh, a good collaboration behind it. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, madam, for a, a beautiful presentation. But uh, I'm told that we have to finish the session by 11 sharply, so I will skip the discussion part and question part. If at all anybody would like to discuss some issues, she is most available after session. And now I invite the last speaker. Before that, I request coordinator to introduce himself. Now, I would like to request our chairman, sir, to present a memento to Milne, ma'am. Uh, now, I will introduce our uh, next speaker, Parande, sir. Uh, he had completed his PhD in IR in New Delhi and postdoctoral research in Soil Science, Aberdeen University, UK. Now he is a Dean and Director of Instruction of MPKV Rauri. Mostly his research activities focused on clay mineralogy, dynamics of potassium, reclamation of salt affected soils in Maharashtra. He started his career as a SRA during 1984 Later, he worked on various posts like assistant professor, chief chemist professor, head soil science and agriculture chemistry, MPK Virauri, and associate dean. Mostly, his achievements is identified the pedogenic formation of paligorskite at expense of smectite in irrigation-based saline sodic shrinks well soils of Maharashtra. He was honored by many awards, and he had more than 200 publications in national and international journal. Now, to, today he is going to deliver the lecture on integrated reclamation technology for salt affected shrink well soils of Maharashtra. I request you. Good morning to all, respected chairman, honorable vice chancellor, Dr. V. N. K. M. Parvani, Dr. Dawanji, co-chairman, Dr. V. D. Bhakre, head department of soil science and agriculture chemistry, M. P. K. V. Rahuri, coordinator Deshmukh, madam, rapporteurs, Today, distinguished speakers, Dr. Takashi, Dr. Milne, at present, Dr. Uh, Magar Saab, our former Vice Chancellor, Dr. Balasaheb Konkan Kurshidev Dapoli, 
Honorable Mahinde Sir, former Vice Chancellor, PDKV Akola, Dr. Sindeji, former Head Department of Soil Science and Agriculture Chemistry, all the scientists from the international and national, and my student friends. Really, uh, this is a very important, you can say, the issue of soil sustainability and soil resilience. This is very much pertaining to these uh, tropical countries like India. And I think in this, uh, already Dr. Takasha and uh, Dr. Milne has already pointed out the way in which this particular sustainability and soil resilience to be maintained in future for getting the sustainable yield and productivity. So I think in this regard, the India is also facing a lot of problem of land degradative process. And that too with the cultivation of these kind of crops, uh, selective crops like sugarcane, where the indiscriminate use of irrigation water and uh, definitely the other semi-arid climatic conditions favor for the development of salt affected soils in the, this particular globe. So I think in this regard, if you see the, see the statistic about this, so definitely you will come across that major area is focused in the salt affected soils where the Asia Pacific and Australia, where it covers near about 195 million hectares of land. And this is going to be again increased during the 2025, the projected area is 236 million, ton, million hectares of this area. That means 6.3% area, area is again going to be enhanced to 11.7%. And it is a similar case with the all the regions of this, uh, particularly on our world. So I think if you see this uh, importance, significance of this salt affected soils, definitely there is a need to have this kind of, if you see the scenario of our Indian condition, definitely the, the rainfall where the low to moderately low and moderate to moderately high, where the major particular salt affected soils are concentrated. And if you consider the geographical area of uh, India is 328 million hectares. And out of that, 6.73 6, 6 million hectares under the salt affected system. Out of that, sodic soils are predominating, followed by the saline soils. Now, if you see the overall this Maharashtra state picture, so definitely it comes to around 1.84 lakh hectares of saline soils and 4.23 lakhs uh, hectares of sodic soils and mostly they are confined to the command areas, 10% area of these command areas of this area. So if you see this overall, the state-wise losses, definitely next to Gujarat, Maharashtra stands here for food grain losses and in economic losses also. So definitely it is a ecological losses also not taken into consideration here, but definitely food grain losses and economic losses are very heavy in our country to the tune of 80,000 million, uh, you can say the losses of rupees. Now, if you see the process of salinization, the, uh, the process of salinization is very common in these arid and semi-arid climatic regions. And what you see, the white uh, particularly surface, uh, which is not a, a snowfall, but it's a really all the crustacean of salts on the surface of this uh, black soil. The factors mainly responsible for this are arid and semi-arid climate, lower topographical positions, very poor drainage, because these soils are string soil soils are predominant with the smectites, uh, clay minerals and which has very low hydraulic conductivity and infiltration rate. Uh, many times the underground water is very saline in nature and uh, overall this uh, irrigating, irrigation scheduling is also going to add the more salts in the systems. And this will give the very uh, correct uh, particular picture about how the normal soils are convert into the saline, saline soils and the saline sodic soil into sodic soil. This is a cycle continuously going on if it is not properly assessed reviewed or managed properly, then this normal soil will be converted into saline soil and based on saline sodic soil and to sodic soil. Of course, a lot of energy is required to convert the sodic soil into normal soils again. Now, these are the particular syringe soil soils under the salinity where you will find the white influence where the electrical conductivity of saturation test sector are always greater than four. So these are the yardsticks we always used based on the UCS lab, based on this particular parameter of PHS and ESP and the ratio of this particular sodium and chloride. Uh, if you take the saline sodic soils, mostly these are uh, uh, little bit waterlogged and uh, having the pH less than 8.5, EC is less than there is a drastic change in hydraulic conductivity of soil because there's a profuse lats of these palugos that cover on this metal surfaces and that will reduce the hydraulic conductivity of our soil system. That is the basic component which we observed with the, you can see the filamental growth of these palugos cut on these surfaces. Now, this is the very, you can say, the negative factor uh, uh, operating on the smectite clay system. 
Now, these are the salt effect well known because there is a definitely growth inhibition, some toxic accumulation of salts in the plant system, imbalance of nutrition, unfavorable osmotic balances, all these particularly poor in root growth and biomass production, all these are the negative signs on the productivity sign and definitely this will create a problem for a productivity system. Of course, it has to be restored. How to restore these kind of things? Definitely there is a good technologies are developed by our SAU's uh, universities, but there is a need to apply, you know, particularly uh, particular degraded soils, especially the, there are physical systems the, like scrapping, land leveling, subsoiling, sanding, all these particular physical methods. Chemical methods are there by use of amendments, soil conditioning and mineral fertilizers. There are biological systems also like organic matter applications, mulching, green manuring and biodrainage systems. And there are some flushing, leaching and improving drainage system, the subsurface drainage system. So a combination of these particular technology needs to be there to restore these. If there is a particularly other consideration, socio-economical aspect has to be considered before applying all these technology into the use. Now, in this case, the gypsum is uh, play, playing a very important role uh, for correcting this, ameliorating this group of sodic soils, where gypsum requirement is very much essential to calculate. And based on the gypsum uh, requirement, we are applying this uh, gypsum to the sodic soils, but where the particle size is always very important, it should be of 2 mm size, and it should be uh, applied surfacely to obtain the dual benefit of rapid dissolution of fine gypsum followed by sustained release of calcium from the coarser particles. So here, there is a need to have the sodium clay conversion into calcium clay, and calcium clay favors for the flocculation and avoid the dispersion and proper structural development of these soils. And because of this, the gypsum is a very popular in Indian text for this application of, but however, there is a limitation of availability of gypsum in future, and we have to find out the alternative for this, because, and these are the alternatives, of course, for gypsum, uh, uh, this can be applied or this can be used as amendment. This is a good, very example where these gypsum is tested for various sodic soils and many crops are responded for good returns in terms of their net profit and even the uh, uh, crop productivity. So gypsum application, if it is associated with the FOM, they, their efficiency is again increased and that is reflected in the cotton seed yield as well as net monetary returns and BC ratio. So this is also good asset to have the, any application of gypsum along with the FOM is always beneficial to make use of these kind of things. Now that's why these are the recommendations from our university, uh, uh, from the particularly uh, four, you know, three universities. So they suggested gypsum powder broadcasting 2.5 tons uh, based on the 50% of gyps gypsum requirement. This broadcasting is associated with the FIM of 5 ton and our placement cake, this is again improving the physical and chemical properties of sodic soils. So all these, there is a need, at least once in a two year, this kind of application is, should be promoted in aspect. Of course, uh, one should have the selection of field crops for their salinity tolerance. These are the sensitive crops where beans, groundnut, bursim, and gram, based on the soil analysis report, you have to select the appropriate crops as a sensitive crops, semi-tolerant crops, and tolerant crops. So group of tolerant crops con consist of sugar beet, cotton, mustard, safflower, and wheat, and sugar can always considered as the semi-tolerant crops in this system. Now, if you see this particularly sodicity, then this tolerance limit is differ. Most of the grasses are tolerant, including the rice and sugar beet. Semi-tolerant groups are also indicated here, and very sensitive crops like cowpeas, gram, groundnut. So all these legumes probably needs to be uh, removed from this cultivation of from this uh, group of sodic soils. So selection of crops is very important when you go for analyzing this group of soils. Now, if you take a consideration of these different crops, this our one of our students, he assessed the different present varieties for the uh, cane yield under sodicity. Definitely, you will find the variety released by our Mahatma Phule Agriculture University, uh, COM265 is very prominent, and that gives the very higher yield uh, as compared to the CO86032, because there is a decree, a very high content of chlorophyll associated with the high recovery also, and CC yield per hectare. So, selection of varieties, is very important for sugarcane for such group of soil is essential. Uh, if you have, because we consider Maharashtra as a horticulture state, in, in this state, before establishment of orchard, one should have to characterize these soils, and based on that, the sensitivity crops like uh, grapefruits, orange, lemon, and strawberry should be avoided, and those are the tolerant and highly tolerant crops should be used for such group of soils. So selection of orchards or fruit crop is very essential based on their tolerance limit.
Now, as aware, the Dr. Takashi and Dr. Milne has already pointed out what is the role of carb organic carbon salt is very important in such group of soil also, which because soil organic matter controls all these particular physical, chemical and biological properties too. And apart from that, the soil health is going to be improved in the way of microbial biomass aggregation, uh, infiltration rate improvement, available water capacity, porosity, even nutrient use efficiency, water use efficiency. All these positive signs are going to achieve and reducing the erodibility, bulk density, crusting. So all unfavorable parameters are going to be reduced by use of soil organic matter, or you can say this carbon is very important uh, to maintain in this group of soils. Now, I, I think all villages, when you think about the smart villages, we should go for the positive carbon, positive inter interventions. And in that case, definitely those are open uh, farm bunds that should be allowed to grow for Gladysidia. And these leaves can be used as a carbon source. Then tank seed application is another way to mix with this group of soils. The use of biochar is also promoted for this kind of thing. The vermicomposting, legume cover crops, and this particularly crop residue management is very much for carbon positive activities has to be promoted in future. Of course, this green manuring, dencha is very suitable for this group of soil because it is very tolerant for the flooding and salt uh, uh, accumulation. The, this bulky organic matter use rice husk or you can say the straws, they always keep these particularly soils in a good physical and chemical conditions. So this kind of initiation has to be initiated. Nutrient management is very key part in this because these soils are very poor in available nitrogen and for that purpose, we have to always support with the organic carbon or organic matter in this group of soils. Phosphorus content is always moderate to high, but based on the soil requirement, the phosphorus application is essential. Now, many times under sodic soil, the availability of phosphorus get decreased. We should monitor the availability status of this phosphorus, and many times higher doses of K fertilizers always gives the good response for this group of soils. And uh, unfortunately, the micronutrient like iron, zinc, and uh, this manganese, the solubility get minimized, and under that situation, more care should be taken for application of micronutrient in saline sodic soils. Many times, boron toxicity can be minimized by addition of our amendments like gypsum and uh, leaching of this group of soils with good quality water. Of course, use of biofertilizer is very essential because uh, here nitrogen uh, fixing biofertilizer uh, use, phosphorus solubilizing bacteria, even the composting biofertilizers and sulfur oxidizing, by, they are very important role to play to enhance these particularly nutrient availability as well as the soil structural properties of this group of soils. Now, uh, some of the important research is also going on in Indian text. The uh, MAU, UP, this very good microbial culture collections are already made by this institute. And this appropriate selection of this micro, microflora can be used at the production unit and used for such type of group of soils. This is another data in the sodic soil. Uh, Dr. Arora has given this very nice data that in, if you use the consortia along with the FIM, isolated from the sodic or saline soils, that is more useful and that will give the more, you can say, the microbial bias, biomass carbon, a higher level and dehydrogenic activity and the reduction in the pH and heat yield is also going to be enhanced. So that is a good, you can say, the based on the local availability of this microflora, one can go for addition of those only instead of going for regular strains of our NPK, you can say, the solubilizers. So this is the uh, research from the, uh, this fungi isolated from the uh, phosphorus solubilizing uh, fungi having the pH 10 and the fung this particular fungi from the phosphate solubilizing the, having the high salinity. So there is a great need to have these kind of things in future. Of course, integrated nutrient management is another key to uh, uh, ma manage this nutrient in future. So appropriate combination of chemical fertilizers, biofertilizers, organic manures, edible oil cakes, non-edible uh, uh, edible oil cakes, green manuring, all this combination is very much essential to promote this group of soils. Fertigation is another important because judicious use of these uh, uh, fertilizers like NPK through fertigation is very important and I think there is a promise to enhance this micro-irrigation in future. Uh, sir, here the surface mulching is also essential because capillary rise of the salt has to be minimized and because of that surface mulching will create a problem. The BBF method is very popular in the Vidarbha and Marathwada, where the salt affected soils, they always waterlogged with this situation. The broad burrow, burrow, furrows method is always useful. And if you apply with the gypsum and the FIM, it is always beneficial to grow such type of things. Now, this is a very important agar uh, technique developed by the Hisar Punjab Agriculture University. And here, the most of the orchard plantation used to go for this 
uh, agar hole techniques where this filling mixture is prepared with the help of gypsum, FIM, rice husk and zinc sulfate. So if you put it, the hard pans or concretions created in the subsurface can be minimized. Sir, drainage method is again very important. Surface drainage, subsurface drainage, vertical and bio drainage, these are the important components. So steps in surface drainage is required because you have to first inspect. Oh, you can wind up. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, measurement of hydraulic conductivity is very important. Laboratory analysis for characterizing. Then plan should be developed. And then excavation, PVC perforated pipe use of this installation. And then water discharge in some well is very essential. I think this is a very good example in the creating Datta Farmers Cooperative Sugar Factory, where it is in uh, formulated the uh, uh, reclamation technology and 1,703 hectares of area. And around 2,257 farmers were associated. So I think these kind of technology, subsurface technology, individual farmer cannot apply because it should be go in PPP mode and with the uh, community basis. I think this is a good example given by Datta Sugar Farmers Cooperative Sugar Factory in our system. The, now this is the, it gives the idea about how, the, how much impact of subsurface drainage is there. So definitely it is a very positive factor to uh, particular enhance this uh, particular soil health and enhancing the crop yield also simultaneously. And that's why these are the important recommendations given by our university uh, for the subsurface drainage. Of course for every farmers it is not easy. Uh, to adopt this subsurface drainage. This is an alternative which is cost economical. Only 5,000 rupees are required for per hectare to create this mold drainage technology. And the university has developed this fully mold plow to have the excess waterlogged conditions or yield drain deep soils where mold, round, um, a mold plow can be used for reclaiming such type of soils. But it's for only two, three years. After that, every time you have to go for these aspects. Of course, this is also found effective in many crops like sugarcane, soybean, chickpeas. Please wind up now. Yes. Sir. This is the bio drainage crops, <coughs> use of proof growing, uh, growing tracts, and these are the recommendations like su uh, Subabul, Eucalyptus, Ramkati, these are very good for our soils. And uh, of course, this research is very much essential in halopites, the quinoa, atriplex, and leucorice, these are the very good uh, promise, uh, you can say the halopites, where needs to be, the research should be strengthened for this. These are showing the positive pro promises for this. Of course, uh, uh, what these particularly, uh, uh, Dr. Takashi has also mentioned the climate smart agriculture technology has to be uh, developed. So precision farming under the salt affected soil is very important and for that matter uh, the database has to be created. University has started uh, developing this precision farming technology by using the full irrigation scheduler. Based on that very precise application of uh, your irrigation water and the scheduling can be possible with this uh, type of aspects. The use of nanotechnology is also essential. The application of nutrients through nanotechnology is another way of uh, combating these kind of things. Of course, these are the some of the way forwards. Alternate to gypsum is very much essential to uh, identify. Guidelines for drainage and water longing has to be developed. Exploring salt tolerant horticulture crop has to be initiated. And alternate land use like forest, agroforestry, halophytes, more carbon sequestering crops has to be initiated. And dynamic database through climate smart agriculture technology needs to be. And synergy of this nanotechnology, microbial and phytoremediation is the need of our. And that's why in concluding, I can say the integrated approach of improvement of the salt affected soil is very much essential and that to adopt by the public-private partnership mode and on community basis. Research potential use of halophytes under crop diversification, phytoamelioration and halophilic microbes need to be studied for reclaiming the salt affected soil and definitely the Maharashtra needs the establishment of AICR on salt affected specially because we don't have only SUs are undertaking such research and doing this aspect. Uh, okay, thank you very much thank for you, giving you, me the you, opportunity you, to have this very please. quick presentation okay, at thank this you, moment. Thank you, thank you. And, uh, it's thank it's you a very much. exhaustive presentation it was anyway, indeed. Thank you. <laughs> please take a seat. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to request present movement to Dr. Farande, sir. Now I request my co-chair to place his remark on this occasion. Dr. Bakri, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, I would congratulate Dr. Dhawan, sir, Vice Chancellor of uh, Vasantarao Naik Maratwada Krishi Vidyapit for uh, chairing this session uh, very efficiently and within time. 
So thank you very much, sir. So uh, th there were three presentations uh, which were uh, of uh, immense importance for the farmers as well as for the researchers. Particularly, uh, Takashi Kosaki from uh, Japan, he had presented on the site-specific fertilization management, which is a very important part these days because what we, the fertilizers, we, the farmers are applying and what the yields we are getting, there is a drastic change and uh, we should know that there should be a specific, site-specific fertilization and uh, it is really a matter of importance because secondly, we are, he has uh, very nicely pointed out that the soil degradation is a major part and that has to be dealt in a precise manner and soil degradation because of which maybe soil erosion, maybe soil, uh, soil salinity and uh, sodicity and all those aspects. We are um, losing much of the nutrients and that's why the use of site-specific fertilizer, fertilizer management is a very essential part that has to be dealt with. And particularly the special variability, uh, as per his uh, comments, uh, the temporal and uh, uh, to the tune of uh, depending on the properties that were examined, he said that the special variability for site-specific new uh, fertilizer management is important. The next speaker was uh, Dr. Eleanor Milne. She also presented a very important topic that is a burning issue, particularly in the world now, because soil organic carbon and carbon sequestration is a very important aspect to be dealt with. And particularly the sustainability of the soils. This is an important aspect. She was very much, uh, uh, she said that so globally soil store an estimated of 1500 pentagram of carbon to the depth of one meter, which is very important and we need to store it more and more. Because whatever the whatever we say regarding the pollution in the country and uh, all over the world, the greenhouse gases and all that. So storing of the soil organic carbon is an important task before all of us, maybe scientists, maybe farmers, or maybe the entrepreneurs. Because all these should have an aspect to see that how much carbon is evolved and how much that is stored in the soil, which will be an utilization for. Because that would also be helpful for the physical, chemical and biological properties of the soil to be improved and thereafter sustaining the soil health. And the last presentation was a very important presentation. Of course, you got a bit less time, otherwise that, would, that was a very nice presentation by Dr. El Farande, the Dean Faculty of Agriculture. He, was, he spoke on integrated reclamation technologies for salt affected soils. Uh, particularly, these are the major problems in uh, our area, particularly in the vertisols of Maharashtra and particularly in the sugarcane growing belt of uh, Maharashtra, maybe in Sangli, Kolapur, Satara, Ahmednagar and Pune districts particularly. And these soils need to be reclaimed with the uh, available resources that are there. And he has mentioned so many resources that can be done, so many technologies, maybe by physical if, uh, physical parameters are there, the biological parameters and particularly the uh, chemical parameters, particularly gypsum. Also by applying the organic matter as well as green manuring, the mechanical practices of uh, having the uh, drainages, the surface drainage, use of uh, biofertilizers. So all these aspects, if they are integrated together, and very particularly, he mentioned about the Dutta Shirol uh, Sugar Factory. They have come together. That is, uh, in uh, coordination, can, we can do it. We, are, can, we can do it in a cooperative manner. That how can we come together for uh, a huge area of having the uh, subsurface drainage system? Because one person cannot do it. So we have to come together to uh, tackle all these problems. Because even if one farmer does it on his field, that would not be an easy task for him. So let us come together, all the farmers can together, the entrepreneurs can, can come together to solve these problems of salt affected soils. So we can go for that. So all these presentations were very good and we are very informative. So I'll congratulate all the three presentations and thank you for giving me a chance to speak on this. Thank you very much, sir.
I would like to request our chairman, sir, please sum up the session, sum up the session with their valuable remarks. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today we had uh, three distinguished speakers who spoke on different issues of the theme, soil resilience and sustainability. You know, the issues of soil management have come to the forefront in the recent years. As the first speaker spoke about the, the close relationship between the soil fertility and the human civilization, and it is a need too, because whenever the soils are neglected, the greatest threats the human civilization has faced, as is evident from our Mojidaura and Harappa issues. So, the soil degradation is posing a great threat to the human survival itself. And that's why the three speakers they spoke on different issues of um, soil management, soil fertility management particularly. The first speaker, uh, Dr. Takasi, who spoke on the site-specific management of the nutrient. You know, uh, this is the very basis of the precision agriculture, is the precise management of the nutrient requirement of any crop, and particularly the crop like sugarcane, which is a heavy feeder unless or until we manage the nutrient very precisely. So the site-specific management of the nutrient not only ensures the balanced nutrition of the crop, but also it avoids the wasteful utilization of the fertilizers. So this is a very important concept, and if it is extended to the sugarcane, I'm sure we can achieve the sustainability goals of the sugarcane production. The next speaker, Madam Milne, although she belongs to the temporal region, but she spoke on the issues of carbon management of the tropical agriculture. And there's again a close relationship between the carbon content, soil organic carbon content, and the sustainability, and resilience as well. And particularly, it's a big challenge for a country like ours, where the rate of carbon decomposition is very high and maintenance of adequate levels of soil organic carbon. It's a big challenge to us, but fortunately we have a technology developed, both as a green manuring and as a sugarcane trash management. Technology is there. So with the help of this technology developed by our universities, how best we can take this technology to the farming community so that we can sustain the productivity levels of our crops, particularly the sugarcane yields, you know, um, they are the productivity levels of the sugarcane yields are as a very miserably very low level. You know, uh, this particular institute is awarding farmers the record um, yield giving farmers, and the record winner farmers yield levels are more or less three times more than the state average. This is just general statement I'm making about it. Coming to the nearly those farmers who are the record winning or record yield giving, the records are 300 tons per hectare, whereas the state average is as low as 100 to 120 tons per hectare. So there is a three times scope to increase the productivity of the sugar cane. So in other way, if we can increase the productivity level even to the 60 to 70 percent of what can be achieved as a record yield, there is a big dent on the productivity issues of the sugar cane. Not only that, but if you raise the productivity to the 70 to 60 percent of the record yields, because record yields mean technology is available. Only thing is that we have to replicate the technology on the large area, on the farmer's field. Even if you raise the productivity level, 60 to 70 percent of the record yields, I am sure that we can free some of the area which is locked under the sugarcane and give it to some other crops, not only land, but the water resources which we are using for the sugarcane, that can be to some extent diverted to some other crops also. But there should be perfect synergy between the drip irrigation and fertilizer management, what you call as a fertigation. So with this, 
without compromising the requirement of the sugar industry for the sugar cane, we can free some of the area which is locked under the sugar cane cultivation to some other crops by way of increasing the productivity and the crux of the matter is the carbon management. So soil organic carbon management not only improves the soil physical, physico-chemical and biological properties of the soil, but it also it ensures the nutrient use efficiency of the chemical fertilizers. Because on that front also we are failing too much. As far as the nitrogen use efficiency is concerned, hardly 50 to 60 percent. Phosphorus is also 20 to 30 percent, rest of the amount gets fixed into the soil. So if you can manage the organic carbon, so the nitrogen use efficiency can be increased, phosphorus use efficiency can be increased. So there is a synergy between the carbon management and the fertilizer use efficiency. So unless and until we harness the synergy between these three nutrients, organic, chemical and biofertilizers as well, as well at the same time the synergy between the water management and the soil management. Water management through drip and soil management through various applications of the fertilizers. The salinity and sodicity is another hazard and particularly the sugar cane belt is the worst affected. So the third speaker, Dr. L. Farande, has given a detailed account of the technology generated by our universities in the Maharashtra. So unless and until we address the issues of salinity and sodicity management, we cannot ensure the productivity of the sugar cane. So all the three speakers, they spoke very nicely, they shared their ideas, they shared their experiences in the field. And I'm sure that if the technology is taken to the farming community in a right spirit, certainly we can address the issues of sugarcane productivity at present, which is miserably low. And that's a bigger challenge for all of us. With these words, once again, I thank all the three speakers and my co-chair, Professor Bhakre. At the same time, I'm very thankful to the organizer for giving me an opportunity to chair this important session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your valuable remark. Now I would like to request our chairman, sir, to present a moment to our co-chairman, Dr. B.D. Bhakre, sir. Now I would like to request our director, sir, uh, Agriculture, Sciences and Technology uh, to present a moment to our chairman, Dr. Dhawan, sir. Lastly, I am requesting Chairman uh, Dr. Dhawan sir to give moment of coordinator to Dr. Preeti Deshmukh. At the end, the moment of out of thanks in short here. It is my proud privilege to prepare, propose out of thanks on the occasion of agriculture session on soil resilience and sustainability session to chairman, co-chairman, coordinator, and uh, last not least, speakers. And also my great uh, vote of thanks to our director general, director sir. Thank you very much. Our next session will start at 11.30, so please come 11.30 for uh, irrigation uh, technology session.